Higher education suffers from the same polarization that the rest of the country does. A recent book by two academics, Holden Thorpe and Buck Goldstein, calls this polarization a broken partnership between academia and the American people. Thorpe and Goldstein claim that academia has upheld its part of the compact, and that the cause of the breach is one largely of perception, that the public isn't really aware of all the good that higher education does. At the Martin Center, we disagree that this is a simple matter of perception. The partnership is broken because of real problems, including ways in which academia treats middle America with contempt. Hi, I'm Shannon Watkins, and this is a Higher Education Moment, a video series presented by the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal. Today, we'll look at the contempt the ivory tower sometimes shows to the rest of us through its hiring practices. What qualities would you look for in a college-level teacher? Would you look for maturity, level-headedness, probity, and a reverence for truth? Or if not, how about a violent anarchist? Early this year, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill hired anthropologist Dwayne Dixon to teach in its Asian Studies department. It wasn't as if his political inclinations were a secret. He was making a name for himself in the radical community as a senior member of an anarchist militia known as Redneck Revolt. Dixon not merely promotes political violence, placing himself above the law in the process, but he commits it. Before he was hired at UNC, he was charged with carrying a loaded rifle while blocking traffic during a protest in Durham, North Carolina. At the Charlottesville, Virginia riot over a statue of Robert E. Lee, an armed Dixon chased a pro-Confederacy protester with his gun, who, minutes later, drove his car into a crowd of leftist counter-protesters, killing one. More recently, Dixon was arrested for assaulting a conservative journalist on the UNC campus. Then there's Alex Porco, who was hired by the English department at UNC Wilmington in 2012, over 100 other applicants. Porco described his first book, which was adapted from his master's thesis, as my book-length ode to an adult film star. It consisted of poems that ranged from the perverse to the infantile. Porco's next book he called Augustine in Carthage and other poems. The titled poem begins as an X-rated rumination of his drunken experiences and thoughts in a Montreal strip club. One of the few poems I can recite goes like this. Time, time aleya, time alina, time aruski, koi, koi aleya, koi alina, koi aruski. And on and on like that for another 22 ridiculous lines. That may be considered creative if he were in third grade. How many of those turned down for the, his job did actual scholarship to get their advanced degrees? Are these the people the UNC system thinks should be put in position to influence young people? The answer can only be yes. How does such a person get a treasured tenure track position at a mid-level public university? especially at a time when many highly qualified humanities PhDs are desperate for full-time work? And why is a violent person like Dixon permitted onto the Chapel Hill campus to teach? And it's not like Dixon and Porco are just two extreme examples cherry-picked to make a point. Over the years, the Martin Center has noticed hundreds of highly questionable academic hires. And if our word isn't good enough, check out the websites The College Fix or Campus Reform where it seems like they uncover another radical faculty member almost daily. Or read David Horowitz's 2006 book, The Professors, The 101 Most Dangerous Faculty Members in America. It almost seems as if Porco and Dixon were not hired in spite of their disturbing behavior, but because of it. And their colleagues chose them. Could they possibly be more contemptuous of middle America? And in many cases, contemptuous of America itself? The American people expected our institutions of higher learning to pass on our culture, our morals, and our fundamental ideas, not spit on them. When academics ask why taxpayers are less eager than before to fund public universities, they need look no further than the presence of Dixon and Porco. Unless the leaders of the ivory tower recognize such problems, and unless they are willing to take major steps to deal with them, they can expect the gulf between academia and the rest of the country to grow wider still. And it is likely that the broken partnership will be repaired, not by academia, but by ordinary Americans working through politicians to address these problems head on. 
If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you wish to comment or learn more, feel free to contact my colleagues or me at www.jamesgmartin.center. Thank you.